And I want to I give honor to him as well, the things that have been done since being here. And thank you all uh, for being willing to go with the men of God that the Lord has placed in your life to lead in. Many great things have been done here. The, 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 the food pantry, the outreach, the, uh, the Celebrate Recovery, the Purpose Institute, all of the things that take place here during the week and around service schedules. Uh, I want to take just a moment and thank you and commend you. And also, congratulations to everyone that has just completed your Purpose Institute exams. I know that's a great relief. I know, <laughs> I know that's a great uh, mile marker. You have the, that first one behind you, and now, now you're going to move on with force. Man, amen. Well, my brother is right, and I want to tell you just a little bit about Luxembourg. I don't intend on giving you a missionary presentation today. Uh, I'll spare you that. Um, I had a short video I was going to show. We're not going to show that. Um, I will just tell you just a little bit about Luxembourg to remind you a little bit, but I've been sent here this morning with a word from the Lord, and so I want to deliver that to you and give that to you. And... Um, We'll let the Lord just deal with the rest of it. Amen. Well, it is absolutely true. When, when you're called, you, you have to go. You, you've got a choice, but it's in your best interest to leave. You can ask Jonah about that. And so uh, I was on staff in Dallas, Texas, in the Fort Worth, between Dallas and Fort Worth area, as an assistant pastor of a church there where... I had come off the street uh, with many years of, of, of problems and drug addictions and alcoholism and all kinds of different things that people ordinarily wouldn't associate with what they see today in my life. And so after 26 years of living a life that looks nothing like the life I live today, I walked into a church and I gave my life to the Lord and I was baptized in Jesus' name and filled with his spirit. And it wasn't long after that they asked me to try and be involved with some of what was going on there with the youth. And I told the bishop there, I said, you know, there's got to be somebody that's been here at this church for a longer period of time that's a lot better experienced than I am. And he said, young man, when you came the first time, I felt something. And you told me that you'd be willing to do anything I asked you to do. And I said, that's true. He said, I'm asking you. I said, I'll do it. And so I began working with the young people, and a year later, I was licensed with the United Pentecostal Church International, read all the books, took all the tests, was approved by the board, and then got my general license and was doing outreach, and I probably taught seven or eight Bible studies a day, and worked a full-time job, and was going to school at the University of Texas, and was driving the bus, and teaching discipleship courses, and preaching to a wonderful congregation, and teaching end-time ministry, and uh, doing everything that I possibly could to answer the call of God on my life. But the thing is, is the call of God came to go to the nation of Luxembourg. And in spite of all of that evangelistic effort that is good, there was no fulfillment. Because when God calls you, there's no peace in staying. When God calls you to go somewhere, uh, doing missions and being part of the church, with, missionaries are specific people that are God-called to go to a specific location to reach unknown people. That's what missionaries do. Everything the church does is not missions, but it contributes to it. Missionaries are still distinctly called people to do the work of God. They are sent. Apostello is the Greek. They are sent people to do what God has sent them to do. And so we had to go, and we did. And so when we, when we left, we went to a country that I had never heard of. I'm from Texas, and I thought Luxembourg was a city in Germany. And so when, when we went, we, we did not go to a place we had visited. We didn't go there to check it out or to see if we liked it. We simply knew that's where God wanted us to go. We packed our suitcases. We took this Bible, and we went over there and checked into a hotel and just stayed. We didn't know the language. We didn't know where to buy food. We didn't have a vehicle. We didn't know how to get around. We didn't have one contact. There was no missionary in that country. There's never been a missionary in that country. There's never been Bible studies taught in that nation. We just showed up because that's what God said to do. And we stayed there for about a year with a handful of offerings as volunteers with no supervision, no contacts, and no help. 
And in that first year, I would say 17 people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Nine of them were baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ. And we got a phone call from headquarters saying, we would like you to come to General Conference and go before the Global Missions Board in 10 days. And so we had contracts and everything signed with facilities and agreements with people. And we left that country, went to General Conference, was unanimously appointed by the Global Missions Board, and traveled on deputation, went back for five years as fully appointed missionaries, and praise God, there's now an apostolic church in the country of Luxembourg. There's an appointed missionary to the country of Luxembourg. There are Bible studies being taught weekly in the nation of Luxembourg. We started also an online. 2020 changed a lot of stuff. I'll just leave that right there. But not only are there in-person meetings there, God has allowed us to be able to start a Luxembourgish website with a Luxembourgish domain that's got content that people can access whether they come to the meeting or not, whether they're able to make it to one location or not. There's a complete exploring God's word Bible study material in two different languages and audio on that website. There's discipleship courses in two different languages, a complete curriculum on that website. There are apostolic leadership lessons on that website uh, with my permission with a passcode that people can access once they get to the place where they're ready for that type of development. And God has allowed us to get a foothold in that country. And for the first time, we are able to tell you that we have got an apostolic church there in that country. Amen. Amen. Luxembourg, Luxembourg is a country that's very small. It's between France, Germany, and Belgium. It's a very small nation, but it's a banking nation. It's actually a very wealthy nation. And a lot of the people there are uh, bankers, investors. They are uh, business people. And a lot of the people there, they're there on corporate contracts. And so when we meet them, sometimes we invest in them, and sometimes they go. And we connect them to an apostolic church where they're going, and sometimes they stay, and we invest in them where they are. But we're there to do the will of God and the work of God. I want to just tell you just briefly, Luxembourg speaks Luxembourgish, French, German, and some English. And so we were able to talk to a few people there when we first arrived in English to try to uh, minister and also find a place to live. I won't give you all the details to that, all the stories there, but Luxembourgish is their national language. That's a blend of Dutch, French, German. Amen. <laughs> we went to French language school and learned French. And so we, we speak French, which is one of their also recognized language. French is their administrative language. So if you're going to read documents, sign contracts, conduct business in that country, you need to know French. That's what was so interesting about getting there, knowing none of that, and trying to get contracts on places to live, places to rent, meet people, and that was completely supernatural, I'll tell you right now, because it was not my ability. God was there. <laughs> God was a very present help in a time of need, <laughs> amen, and he always is. And so that country now, when I say small, I'll give you an idea. It's about 1,000 square miles, and it has 692,000 people in it. That's the country. The capital city has 150,000 people in it, which is where we have our main location. There's, there are 170 different nationalities of people in that country. The China World Bank is there. Russian banks are there. American banks are there. Banks from all over the world are there. And people come and go all the time. We'll hear Egyptian. We'll hear Russian. We'll hear Portuguese. We'll hear English. We'll hear Dutch. On any given day, we hear many, many different languages and meet different kinds of people. And what that means to us is there are a lot of people groups, a lot of cultural groups that I can't reach, we can't reach. And even if we know French, those people don't speak that language. Amen. And so one of the things that we're focusing on while we're there, we're, we, uh, we base everything on prayer. We have to. We absolutely have to. Pr prayer is our first ministry. We don't do any other thing without prayer, and we don't do anything 
until we've heard from the Lord in prayer. We don't. Other people may do it a different way. We have to be led by prayer. You know, it's, it, it's an interesting thing. When you look at the scriptures and take a look at, in the Gospels, Jesus taught his disciples to pray before he sent them anywhere. Matthew 6 is a long way before Matthew um, <clears throat> 18. Actually, he taught people to forgive before he taught them to pray. Because praying is going to be pointless if you've got hatred in your heart and bitterness in your heart and unforgiveness in your heart. And you've got roots of, of things in your heart that are not right. It's going to be pointless to pray. Forgive, release, let go, then pray. Then, then, see what the Lord might ask of you. You know, in Acts chapter 6, the apostle Peter thought it was of the Holy Ghost for them to put a priority on prayer and the reading of the word before they decided to delegate other ministries to other people, Stephen included, and said, we need to make prayer a priority. That was an apostolic template that was being put in place that after the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, now that ministry is going to take place, prayer has got to be the foundation of it all as we move forward, or we're simply doing it in the flesh and not going to finish in the spirit. And so that is our priority, and we try and encourage everybody to be spirit-led and to pray and to walk with God. And so it is because of that that we feel that the Lord has asked us to target certain communities and certain people so that those people that speak certain languages and understand the culture of all these different demographics of people, they can reach people that we can't reach. We're one of our structure, uh, one of our structures there that the Lord has given us is to establish small groups in different places all over the country so that we got core people that are key people to unlocking language groups, cultural groups, communities, and the nation. Amen. I, I can't reach 170 different nationalities of people. The Holy Ghost can. The Holy Ghost can find people that know that culture, speak that language, and settle upon them, and, and their lives can be changed, and we can have an Egyptian pastor. We can have a Portuguese small group leader. We can have a German and a French community pastor. We can have different small group leaders and different small group pastors over each different type of person to be able to communicate with them and speak to them and identify with them, not to segregate them, but to reach them and then bring everybody together at certain times during the month to have common fellowship with translators and build a national body of 170 different nationalities of people so that every tongue in every nation receives and does what God's calling them to do. That's all I'll tell you right now about Luxembourg. Amen. Amen. We're going to still be on the field after leaving for uh, the Lord only knows how long. My daughter's three. She turns four in about nine months. And we are going to start doing um, homeschool. We're going to homeschool our children while we travel and while we're overseas. And so on our table back there, you'll find a treasure chest that on it says donations for children's education. And if you feel led to put anything in there, please know that that's going to help us to give our children an education while they're overseas doing the work of God with us. Also, you'll see on that table several different forms. And this is a partners in missions form. And if you would like to partner with us monthly to help us reach that country, pray about it. See what the Lord would lead you to do and consider this and mention it to your pastor. And with their permission, we would be happy for you to partner with us on a monthly basis to ensure that God's vision is accomplished in that country. Amen. Amen. I feel great confidence today. I feel great confidence today, and I want to share some of that. Does anybody want to hear what the Lord is speaking to me right now? I want to hear what the Spirit is saying. And I will, I'll take you quickly to the Old Testament. I've got, I've just got to, I feel like preaching just a little bit. Is that okay? I'm not wearing a watch. I think I see a clock. But I just want to preach for a little bit today. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for having us here. Remember these forms. And uh, 
if you don't do anything else um, to contribute to what's taking place in Luxembourg, maybe just pick some small thing on that table of ours, maybe a keychain or something, and just call our name out in prayer. That is the most powerful thing that you could do because I know that when you speak and you pray, angels are sent. That's not cliche. That's absolute fact. It could save us from an accident. It could protect us from attack. It could keep our children from harm. It could all of a sudden open a door for evangelism. Anything is possible. If the Lord moves on you to pray for the Favors family in the country of Luxembourg, speak it. I'm telling there have been times we're under great opposition. I'll spare you all those details as well, but we're under severe attack over there and great opposition because we are the first and only missionaries to that country. There's never been apostolic representation on that soil, and the enemy's not too excited about that, but we're going with the name. And there, there have been times my family and I, not to be overly dramatic, but to be very literally uh, clear, We've been driving down the road, and there's been something that took place in the atmosphere around us that people became so upset that they were gnashing their teeth, and they were angry, and they were swerving their vehicle at our vehicle while we went down the road with two babies in the back seat on the way to go teach a Bible study because something is stirring in that area. They are not the spiritual world, not people. The spiritual world is enacting things upon people because it's not happy that God's will is being done, that his kingdom's being sabotaged, that his plans are being overthrown. He's not happy, but when you back here in Mount Vernon feel something in the Holy Ghost tell you, call upon the name of Jesus, speak over Jeremy Favors and his family, speak over the country of Luxembourg, that's going to be a great help. Because at that moment, something supernatural can be released to come and stand with us or interfere with what's going on so that God's kingdom can be advanced. We're still all a part of one body of Christ. We are still a part of the kingdom. And we've got one king, one mission, one priority. That is to obey what he says and be obedient to him. Participate. Every piece and part of that body working collectively together. That's the body. Amen. Pray. Nehemiah chapter 4. I just want to start here. Nehemiah chapter 4. Starting with verse 1. Listen to these scriptures. If you'd like to stand, that's, that's fine. I'll stand with you. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 4 and, and verse 1. Listen to these scriptures. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. It says, but it so happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and he was very indignant and he mocked the Jews. See, this is right after 70 years of captivity. You understand that there was that time where they left Babylonian and Syrian captivity and came back to Jerusalem. And Nehemiah was rebuilding those walls before they went to go rebuild the foundation of the temple. And while they worked, you, you know, they were there reconstructing what would be the outer wall of what represented God's people's foothold in that area. It says in verse 2, and he spoke, we're talking about Sanballat. He spoke before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? And then verse 3 says, Now Tobiah, the Ammonite, was beside him. And he said, Whatever they build, if a fox goes up on top of it, it will break it down. If a fox jumps up there, it will break down their stone wall. You can be seated if you'd like, or, or you can stand. Um, you know, depends on how involved you want to be. I'll stand the whole time. I might even pace a little bit. 
All right. This is something the Lord has put in my spirit for this church right now. I'll tell you the scenario that has been put in my spirit. These are God's people building this wall. We understand the narrative there that they've got a sword or weapons in one hand. And in the other hand, they've got tools because they're building that wall. However, they're holding weapons because they want to defend themselves from that enemy. Right? I'm not going to, I, I don't want to disappoint, but I'm not going to just... Um, machine gun preach and get some cadence going if you're expecting that i'm going to disappoint you badly because i'm i'm delivering a word from the lord for you i'm not going to preach a sermon to you here here's what's going on the enemy was trying to sabotage those efforts of what god's people had built and one of their tactics was not to just go and outright come to the wall and the gate and start trying to overthrow what they were doing. This was not a direct attack. This was a tactic that was employed by the enemy that most people didn't even recognize. And I'll tell you what happened. Sanballat and Tobias decided they were going to begin talking about what the Jews were doing. God's people were enacting and their tactic was to not just attack, but to go and get just as close as they could to where the work was taking place, to those that were working to do the work of God, and get just as close as they could to them and begin talking and begin speaking and begin saying what they believed would happen with all of their efforts. And the most destructive thing that comes from this is the chance that those on the inside of the wall would actually, the intention was that those on the inside of the wall would start picking up that conversation and picking up what they were saying and let it get into their own hearts and their own minds and their own spirits and then on the inside of the wall begin saying the same thing that they were speaking on the outside of the wall. That was the tactic. Just get close enough to those that are actually doing something and start speaking about how it's going to lead to nothing. Just get close enough to everybody that is fasting, everybody that is praying, everybody that is reading, everybody that's in the, Pur the Purpose Institute, everybody that is waking up early and having devotion with their family, every person that is coming to Sunday school and every person that is trying to live good and godly and every person that is walking in obedience to God. Just get close enough to them and start speaking and start telling how it's going to all lead to nothing. And how that after all your effort and after all your money and after all your investment and all of your tears and all of the energy you've expended and all the time you've put in, if just a small fox were to come along and jump on top of what you have built and what you have established and what you have invested in, that's all it will take. It's just a small little fox to come along and the whole thing's going to crumble. And that attitude is the very thing they knew would sabotage the work of God if they could get them speaking that on the inside of the wall. And if people could just start saying, yes, God is good, but you know, they say that if that little fox, okay, common English, yes, God is good, But somebody in our family got sick today. And after all this, after all I've done, after all the effort, after all the worship, I'm the first one at church and I'm the last one to leave. After all of this, when I need something to go right, my child has fever, everyone's nauseous, nothing's working out, the bills need to be paid, that door didn't open, the opportunity wasn't there. After all of this, you see, they say, and the enemy gets you, to question 
Is it really worth it? Is it going to stand? Is it going to last? Are you going to get what you intend to get out of your participation in God's kingdom? Because here's what we've got to get as the people of God in this hour that we're in. If we're after validation, we're going to miss it. If we're after justification, we're going to miss it. If we're after a pat on the back or promotion, we're going to miss it. If we're after comfort or ease, if we're after everything being smooth and everything working out fine, if we're looking at that as evidence for God's favor in our life, we are going to miss it. Our motivation for everything we do moving forward will be contaminated. Our motivation for everything we do to rebuild and to follow Him will be manipulated. Everything that we do depends on us saying, You are good and faithful and reliable and in control and you're my father and I love you and if my children are sick I love you anyway if my day is tough I praise you anyway if they get sick and there is no healing that comes today I'm going to rejoice in the Lord I'm going to rejoice I'm going to rejoice and I'm going to rejoice it's one of the most powerful things that we see in the epistles is the apostle given that apostolic instruction. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. Don't turn off the things of the Spirit. Don't ignore prophecies. Don't shut out the working of the Spirit. God is faithful. Rejoice no matter what happens. Rejoice no matter what you feel. You know what's powerful about that? Not just the words. The fact that when he wrote them, he's chained to a rock wall. He's in prison, shackled to a rock wall. And he's, he's chained here with metal shackles anchored into stone and leaning over on a table saying, don't give up now. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. He is not going to fail you. Rejoice in the Lord. Don't listen to the enemy. He's got his leg anchored. He's in prison. But the powerful, the powerful apostolic impartation is you live in that world. See, because the enemy's going to say, if just a small fox. The enemy's going to say, look, you're the Apostle Paul. You mean, after all you've done, after all you've written, after all the miracles and signs, after all the shipwrecks, after swimming in the ocean, after being wrecked on Malta, after going and preaching... After starting the church in Thessalonica, after going and starting that work in Ephesus, after all you've done, you're going to be chained to a rock wall and this is where you sit. And he says, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. It's not about the rock wall. It's not about the prison. It's not about validation. It's not about saying God recognizes all of my effort. It's not about that. It's all about what you say. It's all about what you say. The enemy wants to poison the church at this critical hour because we are at a turning point. We are shifting from traditional things into apostolic dimensions of authority and power. Write it down. We have made a turn as the church. And we're no longer just church attendees. We are apostolic people with Holy Ghost and fire that are not afraid of any situation but will walk into any type of atmosphere and declare what God has said and what God's will is. Those that are hungry for the things of the Spirit right now is that time because we are going to speak what God has said. It's the enemy that wants to get you repeating what he has spoken. He wants you to say, well, look, in times past, people have stepped out there and said that person could be healed. But if you do it, 
You've built and you've built and you've built and you've hammered and you've chiseled and you've kept the enemy at bay. And now you're in a situation where your loved one needs you. Your family needs you. Your community needs you. This nation needs you. But if you step out there, it's just going to take a small fox. And people have got to decide today, this morning, right now, I'm going to believe what my God has said. I'm going to believe what my God has said. Has he told you what you're going to be? Has he put in your heart? Listen, I'm preaching to some people this morning that you've got an expectation that supersedes this campus, these walls. It supersedes just what you're seeing right now. It goes beyond what you've already witnessed. You've got faith for things you've not even seen yet. You've got hope for things that haven't even happened yet. I know it's true. And here we sit, waiting, wondering when it's going to happen. And the enemy's trying to say, it's not going to take much. And it's all going to come down. But I've come here to ask you this morning, what are you going to say? The enemy's trying to get you to listen to the narrative he has birthed. He's trying to get you to listen to the story he has concocted. And I have come to tell you this morning that the Holy Ghost is requiring you to make a decision. And the question is this, what are you going to say when the enemy comes and says, it's not possible. You have to give an immediate rebuttal or you all of a sudden, uh, you ally and agree with him. No, no. People tend to teach, tell, and think that you've got to walk out the back door of a church, live in adultery, or commit some heinous crime to be sided with the enemy. That's not it. All you've got to do is disobey God, believe the enemy, and you are now in agreement with him. That's biblical. You are going to be in agreement with one or the other. It all comes down to what you say. I'll tell you what it is. The word of God is under attack. Not just this word of God, because it stands sure. This word of God has been under attack for a long time. And it's never failed, never been broken down, and it's never going to fade away. That word stands sure. You can base your family, your future, your hope, your eternal salvation on what is written in this holy word of God. It's an established thing. What is under attack today is the word of God that came to you. That is what is under attack. You have that hope in you and that faith of expectation that something greater is just ahead. And it seems to just be out of reach. It's in there because the word of God came to you. The spirit, even if you didn't hear an audible voice of God, the spirit impressed something on you that deposited the rhema. This is the logos. This is the, this is the forever settled word of God. Rhema is the inspired word of God for a specific moment. And when the Spirit of God drops something into your spirit, that's a word from God. And there's something inside of us that says, God is going to do it. God is faithful. I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. I'm looking around me and I don't see what all I'm expecting to see. I'm not realizing all that I've prayed to realize, but there's something there. What is that? That's a word from God that's been birthed in your spirit and you're carrying rhema. That means that which is uttered from the living voice, that which spoke and the sun appeared. When that voice was mentioned the first time creation came into being. It's that that was deposited into your spirit and started creating life, vision, hope, newness, and establishing things in your life. And it, my friends, is under attack this morning. 
That word that came to you, that promise God gave you is what the enemy is trying to steal. And what you say is going to determine your outcome. What you say. Be careful the next time you go to open your mouth. Be very careful. I'll give you a couple of tips. The next time you feel hopeless, frustrated, and angered, don't speak. Don't speak. <laughs> don't speak because you're repeating the narrative of the enemy. He's telling you it hurts too bad. It costs too much. You can't go any further. I knew it was going to happen like this. I just knew it would go this way. After all this. That's what they said at the wall. I knew after all the money. I knew after all the time. I knew it. After all this. I've tried to be faithful and walk with him. And step out into these different things. And to be all that God's called. And after all this. I knew it. I just. I knew it. That's the enemy. That's not just the enemy. That's severe spiritual attack. That sounds so normal and so natural and so everyday. That we've come to embrace it. That's the enemy. Do you remember Samson? God said, you are going to be a deliverer. The angel of the Lord appears to Manoah. And his wife, and says, this is what's going to happen with this child that's born. You're going to have a son. A razor shall not touch his head. He's going to be separated unto me. He's going to have a vow, a covenant, an agreement with me. And I'm speaking it into existence right now. And later, while he sits in the lap of a seducer, he's there with the promise of God upon his head, with prophetic anointing up on his life, with promises waiting to be fulfilled. And the word of God sitting there inactive. Because he's trying to see how close he can get to the things that bring him pleasure. Because even though he's got power and even though he's got an anointing. And even though he is called of God. He's wasting time and he's listening to the enemy. And he's trying to get just as close as he can to what brings his flesh satisfaction. And that's where he's chose to camp out. That's where he's chosen to stay. And while he sits there, questions are posed to him. Where does your great strength come from? Flattery, manipulation, seduction. Where does your great strength come from? Do you know where it comes from? The word that was spoken into his life. Because his father spoke to the angel and said, according to the word of the Lord, you let it be. The hair was just a sign. The hair was just a sign. The word that God spoke and the agreement that they had, that was the agreement. That was the covenant. That's what was under attack was his submission to God's plan for his life. The hair was only an outward sign of his devotion to that commitment. And Delilah says, you tell me where this great power comes from. And he says, oh, if you were to. And they talk about getting those ropes that have never been on anything. Oh, if you were just to wrap me with those ropes. You see, he just starts running his mouth. I'll tell you something about Samson I never figured out and always thought was crazy. He doesn't have to guess if they're trying to kill him. He doesn't have to guess because the lady he has confidence in and the lady he's speaking to has absolutely enacted and done what he said would destroy him. Tell me what would take away your power. And he tells her, she does it. She does it. 
He doesn't have to wonder, well, I wonder how this is going to go and how this is going to turn out. Would she really, you know, betray me and turn on me? It said there were liars in wait in her closet. There were agents that were there surrounding that main agent that was planted to sabotage and steal that word from God in Samson's life. And they were just asking one question. Where does your power come from? Where does your power come from? Do you know what would have shaken that whole situation and rewritten scripture? If Samson would have stood and said, I've got a word from God upon my life. That's what gives me my authority. I'm chosen from birth. I'm separated unto God. And nothing's going to stop me from doing what God has called me to do. It's already been spoken. That would have changed everything. But he sits there and every time he said, well, this is really what I'm after. Every time he started talking about, I sure would like to go visit that Philistine village and go find someone to keep company with. Every time he voiced what his carnal desires were, the opportunity came and he acted on it. The things that pop up on your computer screen and the things that come into your home and the things that sabotage your spirit are not accidental. At some point, you began to speak and to give voice to what it was that some carnal desire secretly wanted. And when you spoke, that opportunity presented itself. And you've got the choice of whether or not you're going to act on it. See, the thing is, is God has put promise, prophecy And the word in your life. The question is, what will you say? Do you really want what your flesh says are important? Or do you want to see what God's word will bring to pass? Samson was faced with the choice. And I'll tell you what happened. He learned the lesson too late. What happened was, is the thing that he couldn't overcome. The lust of the eyes. The lust of the flesh. And the pride of life. It became a different issue because now that man has got both of his eyes removed. This big man with massive possibilities, with a great call of God on his life, is chained to a meal, to a big stone that grinds wheat. And that arrogance and that pride and that haughtiness was was completely vanquished as he was humbled lower and lower and lower and lower. And the things that used to entice him, now he can't even see them. He's blind and he's walking in circle around this stone and his arrogance is not an issue anymore. He's been beaten down by the circumstances of life that God has allowed. And many times we sit and we curse and we say, why has this happened? Why did this take place? And too many times it's because there's a word of God upon your life and we've chosen to look at other options. There's a word of God upon you, but there's something in your heart that seems to be somewhat disloyal and chase after what comes easier. And the Lord says, I've As much as I don't want to see it, I have to allow this because I've spoken a word in their life. And what has been spoken must come to pass. And he will do everything and give every advantage and every opportunity for you to declare the word of God in your life and agree with it. That brings your life into alignment with the word of God. That's a supernatural shift that destroys demonic influence, that breaks chains of addiction, that gets rid of things that people struggle with for years and they say, I, I couldn't get past it. I couldn't get past the infidelity. I couldn't get past the, 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 the illegal drug use. I couldn't get past whatever it was. Believe me, I'm not judging anybody. I've been there and lived it the better part of my life and I'm telling you, I know what God's word will do. As soon as you say, I choose the word of God and submit to it, that's what breaks the power of the enemy. That's what shatters the chains and breaks those bonds of addiction. That's what chases all of that unfaithfulness out of our heart. That's what stirs us up again and says, I'm in agreement with the word of God.
Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came unto me saying. <whistles> Jeremiah 1 and 4. The word of the Lord came unto me saying. That's what changes everything. And God is calling his people to attune their ears one more time. Because whatever he says, that's what we need. When was the last time you heard a word from the Lord? When was the last time he spoke to you and it, oh my. Let me tell you, oh my. There is a big, big difference between head knowledge and a revelation. You can know a whole lot about what the Bible says, just like any other academic can know pages and pages and books and books and volumes of information about any subject. But when you get a word from God and you get a revelation, book knowledge has to take a back seat. And I'm all for everybody doing everything that they can to enhance and broaden their understanding or their, the information that comes from the word of God. But at some point, I pray that we find ourselves in a, in, a, in a place with him where that word brings revelation to us and it speaks. And it doesn't just sit there as black ink on a white piece of paper, but something gets beyond those pages and sinks into our spirit. And we're able to stand and say, I've got a word from God and there's not anything that's going to deter me. My family is going to be changed. My family is going to be saved. This situation is not impossible. And all of a sudden our speech that's what matters. You listen to yourself. What you're saying tells whose side you're on. It doesn't matter what you're wearing. It doesn't matter what address you live at or where you attend church. It doesn't matter. What matters is what you're saying. That tells whose side you're on. You're in agreement with one or the other. You can't have two masters. We've got to speak what he's saying. We've got to say what he puts in our heart. Jeremiah, I've called you from birth, and I'm sending you. I've anointed you to be a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah 1.4, and then he goes on to say, you're going to speak what I put in your mouth. And regardless of what they look like, you're going to blank out their faces and continue to just declare what I have said, because that means you're in agreement with me. It doesn't matter if they're not in agreement with you. It doesn't matter if they're against it. It doesn't even matter if they understand it. Your job is to be obedient and be in agreement with me. Now what are you going to say? And half the time Jeremiah was crying. Half the time he was weeping and sobbing. But the fact is, is he made the decision, I'm going to declare what God said to speak. He gave us power and authority not to feel better. He never even said we were going to feel better. He never even said we were going to feel good while we did it. He did not say that everything was going to be easy and streamlined and simple and carefree and casual. He did not. He said, I'm going to give you strength to endure as a soldier. Endure the hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Take up your cross daily. And follow me. Die to your flesh. Die daily. Surrender and submit to me. Go to that garden of Gethsemane one more time. And spend some place there. And see if you can hear the words that the Spirit is saying. Go there and surrender one more time. And say, not my will. But whatever your will is, that's what I want to be done. You know, my, see, because it's... It all sounds wonderful, especially in a church setting when we expect a presentation about God's word. It all sounds wonderful until we have to live it. And that's what God is calling us to. He's calling us to live it. 
not just say we believe it. I've got to be real honest with you. I would not be delivering you this message this morning if it's not what I believed 100% what the Lord wanted me to do because this is as far away from what I would ordinarily just do. Did, no, no. But I decided a long time ago, I can only obey and say what he said say or I'm in disobedience and I'm not willing to do that. I'm not willing to do that. I've, I've, had, to, I've had to learn a hard, hard hard way and I will not I will not disobey I don't care what people think about me I don't care what people say I don't care if people like me or not I would prefer that people liked me sure but when it comes to my relationship with God it had to be settled his opinion matters more than mine and his opinion matters more than yours. You can't hurt my feelings bad enough to make me hate you. You can't say anything to me that would make me attack you. You cannot hurt me bad enough to make me stop praying for you. If you don't like me and you throw things at me, I'm going to pray for you that God would establish you and bless you and make you fruitful in every way that your life would bring glory to his kingdom. <laughs> I don't care what people think. I can't. And I think the child of God, every single child of God has got to get to the place where we remember that he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. Not our peer groups, not our community, not even our family members. What are we going to say? What are we going to say? See, here's the thing. I, my mother called me and she says, Jeremy, where are you at right now? Because that's a common question. Where are you at right now? Well, I'm not in Europe. I'm over in the States. I'm traveling right now. This was, this was maybe five, six years ago. I'm over in the States right now. I'm traveling. I'm up north. I'm in Minnesota. And uh, she said, all right, let me just get to the point. I've been diagnosed with leukemia. And they're, they're, I've talked to two different specialists. There's a lot that's going on. They don't hardly have any answers, but they said it doesn't look good. And I'm going to have to go in for more tests and then go see another specialist. Can we pray? And I said, of course we can pray. And listen, listen. <laughs> I said, of course we can pray. And right then the Holy Ghost went, hang on. I'm, look, please understand. I, I realize that I'm younger than a lot of you, but I do not have the liberty of just speaking something I have not had to live myself. Uh, I'm not being used as a vessel from God to call people to a place that I've not. That would be wrong. Here's what she said. Can we pray? And I said, sure, we can pray. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost just stopped me. There was a warning. And I told her, I said, all right, all right. This is what we're going to do. I said, I will pray for you, but here's how we're going to pray. Jesus, we trust you with this situation. I don't know why you've allowed this, but whatever purpose that you have in mind for allowing this, do, listen, do not remove this out of her life. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, okay. <laughs> do we believe it or not? Are we going to live it or not? This is my mother. I love her. I love her. That's my own mother. You're going to speak that way to your mother? No, the Holy Ghost was speaking that way to my mother. Mom, we're going to pray, but I pray right now in the name of Jesus. See, God's in control of everything. He's in control of every detail of his children's life. 
Every single hair is still under critical observation. He knows every little minute detail. And he either causes it or allows it in his children's life for some purpose. And the end result is what he calls good. Either I believe that or I don't. He's allowed my mother to get leukemia. Okay, test. Pass or fail. No middle ground. You've allowed this for some reason or another, and I don't understand why, but we trust you with this situation. And whenever you're finished with this, remove it from her life. Until then, we trust you with it. Be glorified, and your will be done in the name of Jesus. Do I do that every time? Absolutely not. Are there times where I've commanded healing to immediately come? You can guarantee it. But I don't decide that. The Holy Ghost does. I don't decide that. The Holy Ghost does. And in this case, I had to put my personal feelings in check and say, this is what we've got to do. You see, because I wasn't raised by a pastor. My father doesn't even attend church. He's 71 years old and still not living for God. And so it could be that the Almighty is working some plan to get his wife in a situation that is so desperate. He's got to reconsider things again. And God's given him one more chance to come to him and get things right. Now who am I to stand in the way and try to interfere? And God forbid I try to overthrow God's plan and say this is what I demand you do. And so we trusted him with it and said, I submit this into your hands. You're God, not me. And I said, Mom, I know that's not what you wanted to hear, but that's what we have to do. And she said, I trust you, and I trust him. I'll call you when I go to the doctor again. I said, that's good. It was about six days later she called me, and she said, I went in to go talk to some specialists, and they told me that the cancer is getting larger. I said, okay, test. What am I going to say? What am I going to say? Test, everybody. God, I knew you would do this to me. I trusted you. My own mother's got leukemia. I put my confidence in your word. I was even trying to be led by the Spirit. And now look. Oh, no, 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 no. Absolutely not. So the cancer's bigger. Now it's a different issue. Test. She said, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to pray the exact same thing. And we prayed the exact same thing. I said, go back to the other specialist and tell them. She said, I'm scheduled in three days to come back to this specialist. I said, that'll be fine. I said, that'll actually be even better. Because the same person will have to change their specialized diagnosis. When God does this, she said, okay. And so she goes back to the doctor three days later, and they tell her there is no leukemia. It, it's not a, well, yes, it is a wonderful thing, praise God, that she was healed. But we know God's a healer. The issue is what were we going to say? We know God's a healer. We, that's not an issue. We know God's capable. That's not even under, under question. What's under question is what do we do when we're under pressure? What do we do when God says, hang on to this? Speak that. Stand on my word. Have confidence in me. That's what matters is what we say when we're getting two different conversations. One from the enemy and one from our Savior. What are you going to say? There's somebody sitting right now in a hospital room with a kind pastor at their bedside. This church has got something that they can say. There are people in this community all around us with people that have great needs in their homes. What is this church going to say? There are families sitting right here that's got stuff that looks impossible in your own life, your own marriage, your own family situation. What are you going to say? What comes out of your mouth will greatly determine what takes place and what you, what you live with for the rest of your life. 
You come into agreement with one or the other. I pray in Jesus' name we align ourselves with this word of God. He gave us power and authority over all unclean things. He said, in my name you'll cast out devils. I gave you, he says, authority over all the power of the enemy. You're going to receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. It says he called his 12 and gave them power and authority over all devils and all diseases. Now, now what are we going to say? We know the doctrine. We can quote the scriptures. But what about the situation? What are we going to say? I'm going to give you the scripture that the Lord wanted me to give you. And we'll close with this. My sister, could we sing? Not this moment, but whenever you're ready. Believe me, I'll take a few minutes. Whenever you're ready, that last song that we sang before preaching, I would, I would uh, like to end with that. Let me just give this to you really quickly. I jotted down this scripture. It's been on my heart all week. This is for you. I just want to, let me ask real quickly. I hope I haven't made anybody too uncomfortable or the Holy Ghost hasn't, but I need you to bear with me just a few minutes because this is important. I don't know how badly I'm messing up the schedule, but I'm, I'm, I'm under orders of the Holy Ghost, and I must do this. I need, I need three volunteers. I need two full-grown men and one small boy. Right here. Is that our little boy? Where's our little boy? Someone preferably about half the height, small boy, waist size. Perfect. That's good. I'll tell you what we'll do. I'm going to read you this scripture. Psalm 139 and verse 5. Now, Psalm 139 and verse 5 is prophetic. And this scripture is what the Lord wants you to live. This scripture is what the Lord wants you to know. And this scripture must become your reality. The scripture says, you have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Why is that so powerful? For one, that's the word of God. And for another, that's the rhema for you today that the Lord has specifically inspired for you. The Amplified Version says this. Listen to this. You have enclosed me behind and before. Listen. And you have placed your hand upon me. Now, listen. I don't know what the enemy's telling you. I don't know what the enemy's telling you. But this is something the Lord said that needs to be indelibly imprinted and pressed into your mind. That power and authority, if you've not yet been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and received the gift of the Holy Ghost, that's where you receive the power and the authority. You get the power from His Spirit and the authority from His name. You get the power from receiving the Holy Ghost and the authority by taking on His name in covenant agreement in Jesus' name baptism. That's where you get it. If you've not had power come to your life to help you overthrow everything you're facing, you need to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost today and right now. If you've not yet been baptized in water in that saving name of Jesus Christ, today is the day you need to go down in water and repent and get that name of authority on your life so you can stand against everything that is coming against you and speak with authority of the kingdom. Ephesians 6 says this isn't just life we're going through, but we're wrestling against principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness of this world. Yes, it's got power, but when you're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, that's all the power there is. That's all the power there is. 
Yes, it's real power keeping people bound. Yes, it's real power coming against you. But his power overthrows all the power of the enemy. If you've not yet been baptized in water, received the Holy Ghost, today is that day. If you have, this verse describes perfectly what it is God has for you and is offering you. If you'll receive this word into your life, make this your reality. He said, I'm going to be in front of you, and I'm going to be behind you. Come here, little buddy. Stand right here for me, please. Now, I want you to face this direction, sir, the opposite direction. And this little guy here, here we go. You get as close to you can right up there, and you stay directly behind him, all right? Now, I want you to just walk to the end of those chairs, turn around and walk right back here. You guys all follow real close. See, this little guy right here represents us. We're child of God. We're sons of God. We're sons of God. Whether you're male or female, you're a son of God. Whether you're male or female, you're the bride of Christ. Goes both ways. But this is you. You're a son of God. And his word says, I'm going to go before you and I'm going to come behind you and I'm going to place my hand upon your head. And so not only is he given his promise that he's going to guard the front and enclose you in the rear. Now he said, I'm going to keep my hand. Let's walk. Now I'm going to keep my hand upon your head and wherever you go. You are locked in on every side, and my hand is protecting you. My hand is upon you. Now, that's what the Bible says. What are you going to say? You just ask yourself about what you're facing, what your family situation looks like, all the doubts. Listen, you've built, you've built, you've built, and you've labored. You're working on that wall. You're constructing the things of God. And the enemy says, if just a small fox comes along. Now, who are you going to listen to? The enemy? Or are you going to listen to the word of God that says, I've got you here. I've got you here. And my hand is upon your head. You see, God gets real jealous. Because we like to put our hands over things that are ours and say, no, that's mine. You can't touch that. That belongs to me. I'm going to safeguard that. You can't get close to that. That's mine. And God says, I'm going to put my hand upon your head. That's not a gimmick. That's a word from God. That's not a Sunday school illustration. That is what God told me to show you this morning. He needs you to believe that. Receive that into your spirit and make this your reality. Now, which are you going to believe? It's either all about to fall apart. It's either all going to start turning into complaint and issue and problems. Or you're going to believe that God's got me in the front and God's got me in the rear. And his hand is upon my head. Kashata rabakito rabashata. You can be seated. Thank you, sirs. Now, I want to tell you. Sister, could we sing now? While I was sitting right where she is before service, I'll tell you what came to my spirit. Please stand with me. I'll tell you what came to my spirit. While we were worshiping, these scriptures were on my mind. And the Lord is in this place. And I'll tell you what came to my mind. All the issues that are represented here. All the needs. I'm intentionally not going fast. I hope that doesn't disturb you. I'm intentionally not going fast. Do you know everywhere Jesus went, he walked and never ran? Not one time in scripture was he in a hurry. He never jogged, ran, or sprinted anywhere. But he was always exactly where he needed to be. You know, and I think sometimes if we just slow down, instead of just getting it here, we're going to get it here. It's not intellectual stuff that's being given today. It's impartation by the Holy Ghost. 
Our flesh is on a time clock. The spirit never is. And if we can slow down and get into his presence, there are deep secret things he wants to show us. He wants to speak right into your situation and say, fear not. I'm here with you. I've got you guarded in the rear. I'm leading the way in the front. And don't forget my hand. It's right there. Come on, believe this. My hand is right there upon your head. Now, this is what the Lord showed me while I was over here just worshiping. There are needs represented in this place that are decades old. And you're still wondering why and you're still wondering when. Decades have passed. And I'm telling you what I felt in the spirit this morning. Jesus said, today I'm coming. And I saw the bottom part of a leg and a foot with a leather sandal stepping right into this sanctuary. And his foot walked right in here. And I was in my spirit. I said, where's the rest? What about the rest? He said, you just walk with me. You just walk with me. I don't know where your faith is this morning, but I'm telling you right now, his foot, he just stepped right in this place. Now, what are you going to say? The enemy's a liar. You've been given power and authority. You're in covenant relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of glory. He's coming back for a glorious church, a victorious and triumphant bride. He's coming back for a church that is not surviving, but is worshiping and rejoicing. Because even if there's a shackle, even if there's a prison, even if there's a shipwreck, even if there's pain, we're going to say, I've got the word from God and I'm in agreement with him. I'm going. Listen. Listen, I was in prayer one night. I was in France. I was in a dark, dark room. It was solid concrete. And it was just a cold, dirty concrete floor. And I was laying there face down, weeping with tears all over the pavement. And I was just in that place alone with him. And the Lord showed me this vision of all the disciples headed out, going over the sea. And they were in that boat. And they were trying to see what God would do. Listen. He was not there. Did I lose you? Is everybody still okay? He was not there. Oh, you missed it. You missed it. Jesus sent his disciples. They were in a boat. He said, go. And they were going into something that he knew they needed. He was not there. He was on the mountain. And I was there on my face praying in the Holy Ghost in total blackness. And a vivid image came to my mind. And I saw them going out with all their might trying to do what the Master said. And they're facing a storm, living in fear. And I saw him on the side of a mountain. And he turned and he looked right at me and he said, Jeremy, are you coming? And I said, yeah. Yeah, I'm coming. And I just weeped. And I just interceded. Because that's what I'm going to do. I don't care where everyone else goes. I don't care what everyone else desires. When he looks and says, are you coming? I'm walking away from everything. I'm walking away from everyone. I just want to get on that mountain with him. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, and you're working in this place. I worship.
Are you coming? Are you coming? I've got a specific word for you upon this mountain. Now are you coming? I worship you. You are here. You're going to have to climb just a little bit because I'm not down in the valley. I'm up on the top of a mountain. But if you want to be with me, just take just a little bit of time. Seek after my face and forget about your problems. Seek after my face and forget about your issues. Are you coming? I'm going to give you a word. I'm going to speak to you. And it's never going to be the same again. I'm going to speak. Let my word do the work. Let my word fulfill its purpose. Let it go forth and accomplish what I've sent it to do. In the name of Jesus Christ, I take authority and dominion over the spirits of fear and anxiety and doubt this morning. And I release a prophetic word of God right now to come to speak to those hungry hearts that are willing to open their eyes, open their spirits, and lift their hands to Him. In the name of Jesus, receive the rhema word of God. Begin to speak under the power of the Holy Ghost. I worship you. What he wants you to say. I worship you. You are here. He's not in a hurry. He's not in a hurry. He's asking who's coming. He's not wearing a watch. He's asking who's willing to come. Lord come to you. Let the word of the Lord come to you. It's not going to be the same. It's not going to be the same. Speak what he says. Speak. If you need supernatural help for the breakthrough that God has for you this morning, lift both hands straight up in the air right now. Lift both hands straight up in the air right now. That foot, that foot that stepped in this place, be released right now in the name of Jesus Christ. I release the name of Jesus to come to your situation. Receive it. In the name of Jesus, the touch of God and the angel of the Lord is going to minister to you right now. In the name of Jesus, receive it. Receive it. You've got to get a boldness back in your spirit. You've got to stop being afraid of the words, thus saith the Lord. You've got to let it come back upon you again and say, He's speaking to me and I'm going to speak to this situation. He's speaking to me and I'm going to speak to this storm. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, my Redeemer lives and I'm going to rejoice. We're going to be triumphant. I'm going to walk over it and He's going to take Don't let your mind or your intellect tell you that just because it didn't come in half a second, it's not for you. Jesus is never in a hurry. Never. The supernatural is not magic. 
We do not speak incantations. We do not wave a wand. The supernatural is attached to the word of God and your faith. We make miracle work. Even when I don't see it, are you coming? What are you saying? Are you coming? The wave of the Holy Ghost is moving into this place right now. Open up your mouth. And if you've got the Holy Ghost, begin to release it. Speak with other tongues right now. Rejoice and worship God. And he will give you victory. Open up your mouth and speak what God is speaking in the Spirit.
so much for being a part of worship this morning. I realize sometimes we're, we're challenged with norms. Our norms have to change. Here's what I want to leave you with. The last thing I'll say to you before I go. There are many oppositions in taking your family overseas to start an apostolic church in a country where there's never been. And all the details that need to be managed on two continents while you do that, natural stuff, supernatural stuff, normal stuff, spiritual stuff, there's a lot going on. I want to share something with you I think you might be able to identify with. It wasn't long, well, years ago now, I was at a conference and someone came up to me and said, I've got a specific word for you. And I said, let me hear it. This is what they said. You are in a win-win situation. And let me just be real honest with you. It took every bit of Holy Ghost I had to receive that word. Is everybody okay? Is that all right? It took every bit of Holy Ghost I had to receive that word. Let me tell you, we're skeptical people. Human beings are skeptical. We are natural. We're, we're what we call normal, which is what God is not. We are natural, which is what he is not. And when he starts speaking things, we try to analyze it. And we look at what we see as evidence and go, well, this don't add up. Now listen, that person came to me with a word from God and said, you're in a win-win situation. And I went, you've got to be kidding me. Do you know what I'm up against? Do you know what we're facing? Do you? I didn't say this to that person. I said, thank you. I receive it. But I, hey, pastor. I said, you've got to be kidding me. Do you know what I'm facing? Do you know what all the challenges are? Do you know everything that's got to fall into place for this to even almost be possible? That was the natural but then there's the Holy Ghost that says, what are you going to say? The word of the Lord said, you're in a win-win situation. You're looking at how much it costs, how long it's going to take, how bad it's going to hurt, all the legal issues, the problems, the process, and you're gauging it. But what are you going to say? And I finally had to get my little hands off of that word and say, Jesus, I'm in a win-win situation. I am in a win-win situation. I can't lose. We can't lose. We can't fail. God is with us. And if God is with us, if God's before us, and that's not just a general message. That's something that every person has to get the revelation of and say, that's reality. I am in a win-win situation. If you've been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and received the gift of the Holy Ghost and he's before you and behind you and his hand is upon your head, you cannot lose. I don't care what it looks like. Don't focus on what you see. Focus on what he said. Don't focus on what you see. Focus on what he said. I know God is going to do great things in Mount Vernon. I know God is going to do great things in Luxembourg. And I'm excited to one more time see you. It may be five more years. But when I come back, I know we're all going to have grown and have testimonies of great victories because we are in a win-win situation. God bless you. We do have good news, yes. Beth has been coming to part of our church family now for, did you say, about five years? And maybe six, could be seven. Let's see, eight, do I hear eight and a half, eight and a half, and a nine, nine and a ten? So she's been coming. We've had the privilege to have Bible studies with her. And Beth loves God, is so hungry for God. And she has been wanting the Spirit, but was brought up in a way that was taught that speaking with tongues is not either is not for us or is even not of God and those types of things. And so she had mentioned that she never thought she'd ever receive that experience. But today, hmm. today, 
She received the gift of the Holy Spirit. She said it felt like an angel was on this side and an angel was on this side. And all of a sudden, she began to speak with other tongues and worship and magnify God. Let's give thanks to God for what he's done for Beth today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I got to hear portions of Brother Favor's message. I was at, at KCH, or a lot of abbreviations in Mount Vernon. It was at KCH, ICU, and ER. And Papa Sheets is in the ER, or in the ICU. It, after an MRI from KCH in the ICU, it appears he had suffered a stroke. So I was there with him, with Nana Sheets and with Brother Clay, and they are optimistic that he's going to recover, hopefully go into a nursing home, work on some physical therapy and speech therapy. But thank you so much for your prayers. While there, we could feel the presence of God in that ICU. And then as I was leaving KCH ICU, I was told that Sister Dina Lehman had brought her husband into the ER for some chest pains. So they ran some tests on him. Everything appears to be normal. Maybe just overdid it working in the yard yesterday. But thank, thankfully, it looks like he, too, is going to be okay. But I was listening just to some portions, and I heard Brother Favors, you had mentioned some decades-old type things that people had been dealing with and prayers that people had been praying. And we know at least one five-year-old prayer that somebody has been praying received the Holy Spirit. God answered today. So thanks, thanks be to God for his goodness. What an awesome God we serve. Praise the name of the Lord. Just two announcements. Number one, I... I want to continue to hear a word from the Lord. And I have noticed when I hear from God most is when I'm spending time with him in prayer. And I, I'm asking everybody who can be next Saturday night, or this coming Saturday night, I should say, 7 p.m., please join us here in the sanctuary and let's band together as a church family. I want to hear another fresh word from the Lord. So let's bind together, band together, and let's pray together. Saturday night, 7 p.m., here in the sanctuary. And then this coming Sunday... Our seniors ministry is having a fundraising lunch to raise money for their senior trip that's coming up pretty soon. Or I'm not sure if it's soon or if it's September, September soon, yes. So they're going in September on a seniors trip and they're raising funds to help them go. They're having lunch tomorrow, next Sunday, so please join with us a week from today and let's have fellowship and support them. In order to help offset the cost of a large lunch like this, they're asking that families could help us by donating some groceries by Wednesday have to have it by Thursday night so if you can help us with these I'm going to call the groceries out maybe you have them in your cupboard already if you can help us with these raise your hands sister Hines is going to record and then we will dismiss so the quicker we get to dismiss the quicker you get to go to lunch so if you raise your hand on all of it we'll go right now here we go we need 40 pounds of potatoes you don't have to bring all 40 you just maybe 10 10 10 10 doesn't matter how many all 40? And then she has the rest of the paper, so we're good. Let's go. <laughs> two bell peppers, Sister Strickland has. Two gallons of milk. All right. Mushrooms, how many? A quantity of mushrooms? A container. Harry's will take care of the mushrooms. I get what's left over. Shredded Colby cheese. Thanks, Sister Potter. Shredded Parmesan. Sister Jobina, baby spinach. Brother Gavin, two tomatoes. Watch, somebody just scratch their nose. Be careful, because I'm going to call you on it. Who's got two tomatoes? Brady, two frozen pie shells. Sister Strickland has two of those. We need six more frozen pie shells. You have two over here? We got two over here, we got two over here. So we got a Jody and we got a Katie. So two, 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 and two. So we got those. Broccoli. You really don't need to bring broccoli, so never mind. We're going to go to the next one. <laughs> Who wants to bring broccoli? There's one in every crowd. Broccoli? Sister Mapes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> one box of... <laughs> Who is that? <laughs> Mackie. <laughs> one box of quick oats. Sister Elliot has those. And then juices. What kind of juices do we need, Sister Hines? Juices. Juices, juices. You've got orange. You've got apple. You've got two apple. You've got orange. Is that it? Or do we need more? Are we good? Sister Potter, you have juice? Some kind of exotic juice that you're growing in your, in your garden? That's awesome. Anybody? What in the world? 
I think we have, do we have everything? Okay, super. Thank you so much for being here. Saturday night, 7 o'clock, we pray. Sister Tasha, what did I do wrong? Oh, yes, 3130 is tonight at Sister Dawn's house, 5 p.m. Young ladies ages 10 to 18, 3130, young ladies devotion. Sister Dawn's house, if you need direction, she's right over there. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Let's celebrate with Sister Beth and what God has done for her. Congratulations, Sister Beth. Also, be sure to go by and visit the Luxembourg booth right out here, not in Luxembourg, but in our lobby. Go visit the Luxembourg booth in the lobby. 